So I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to, to speak. I, uh, I actually often go by, by, by Randy because I, I collaborate a lot with, with Billy R. Wooten and I find that too many Billy R's in a small room is a little, a little overwhelming. Plus, I, I actually don't have an erotic attraction to rod photoreceptors. It, it, mild uh, arousal, uh, top. But, uh, but uh, Randy, and I'm, I'm going to be talking today about macular carotenoids and, and visual function. And, and before I start, I'd just like to, to make a, a, few, a few comments about, about visual function. And the first is I think that there's a, a common trend, especially when you talk to uh, optometrists, to think of a visual function as, as snell and acuity. In fact, it's, it's uh, often uh, the, a primary variable in a lot of clinical studies as well. And, and, and I think that's, that's certainly reasonable because we're, we're in a sort of pandemic of, of refractive error now. And, and in fact, uh, if you look at, for example, the incidence of, of myopia across this century in the United States, in the, the beginning of the century, the incidence was about, you know, about 8%, and by the 70s, it was up to about, about 25%, and, and now it's close to, uh, to about 50%. And, um, you know, in, in some uh, countries in Southeast Asia, the incidence can be uh, as high as two-thirds of the population. So, uh, so for example, in this study uh, from a group in, in Singapore, looking at uh, especially young people in, in Southeast Asia, the, the ones that were on the, the sort of fast educational track had, a, had an incidence of myopia that was almost 80%. So, uh, so, so uh, it's, it's, it's a true uh, epidemic, especially in, in that country. However, I think that, um, that you know, uh, of course, there are many other uh, characteristics of, 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 of visual function that, that assess very different things. And, and acuity doesn't predict a lot of those other visual functions particularly well. So, for example, this, is a, this was a large study that was done by uh, Toss Vandenberg some years ago where he, uh, he measured acuity in this very large sample of of European drivers and, and then measured the amount of uh, intraocular stray light in these same subjects and found that you know, even very young subjects, there was a huge uh, range in, in the amount of light scattered within the, the ocular media and that that really had no correlation whatsoever to, uh, to, to, to their snell and acuity. Um, and, and so, I think, it, I think it, one thing, and it's certainly when I try to think of how the macular carotenoids are related to visual function, I, I think it's useful to, to, to uh, consider the kind of factors that were present when the mechanisms for, for accumulating macular pigment evolved. And, uh, and certainly that wasn't, it wasn't sort of the, the newer case of doing things like, like reading. In fact, the... Uh, these are these uh, these 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 studies with uh, with with young uh, patients from uh, or young subjects from Southeast Asia have prompted the, the most common explanation for for this for this rise in, in incidence of refractive error, and that is the the how much we use our eyes for near work now. Um, so so uh, and, and especially according to my my nine year old son. Things like reading are very unnatural. Video games, of course, are extremely natural to our, to our species, but, but reading is, a, is an unnatural activity. Using your extraocular muscles are so, so commonly. Most of, for most of uh, the history of our species, what we did was, was, was distance vision. So when you, uh, you think of the, the, the visual circumstances for most hunter-gatherer tribes, what, do you, what you really use your eyes for or to see items at a distance, or uh, farmers and things like that use their vision for, for farm things, cows and sheep and stuff, and, uh, but, but, but things, at, things at a distance. And, um, and so, so I think that when, when you think about, you know, what, what, did, our, what did our eyes evolve to, 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 to be used for, it was, it was vision under natural lighting circumstances like the sun, and, uh, and, and that kind of thing. And I always like to say at least one profound thing in every talk I give. So the fact that optical effects are optical. 
seems, seems strangely profound to me. <laughs> but, you know, the, the macular pigments are a yellow filter. And, and, and the fact is, of course, we know a lot about the visual system. It's probably the most worked out neurological system in the body. And we know a lot about optics. So, so any optical effects that the, the pigments should have are, are really perfectly predictable as long as you know the optics of the stimulus array and, and the characteristics of, of the visual system. It's not hard to, to design experiments to, to assess what these filters do. Um, and and it's, it's also equally not hard to, to, uh, to intuit what they do not do. For example, um, you know, if you, if you filter blur, basically you just get less intense blur. Or, or if you use visual stimuli that are composed of, of many of the, of the light sources that we encounter indoors, it's unlikely that the pigments would affect that, at least optically. So for example, if you use a tungsten source, you know, that's a lot of, of longer wave light not filtered by the pigments. Or if you use a fluorescent source, that's also a lot of longer wave light. However, if you use stimuli that have a very broadband shape, you know, then you have a lot more shortwave light, much more likely that you'll, you'll see an effect on, a, on visual function. Now, now when, 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 when we think about the fact, uh, do, you know, do the pigments affect visual function? We, we of course, know that they absolutely do. And, and one reason we know that is that we can measure the pigments with psychophysical techniques. We can measure the, you know, people will see a visual stimulus and, and uh, have a psychomotor response, and, and we can measure the pigments quite in a quite linear manner. So for example, this was a study that, that uh, actually John participated in when he, when he had his brief visit to the United States, and um, where we measured uh, macular pigment density in a group of, of patients with early AMD, and, and that's certainly a common way of measuring the pigments, the flicker photometry technique. But of course, there's many psychophysical techniques that can be used. There's color matching and threshold determinations, motion photometry, all behavioral responses, though, to visual stimuli. So, so the, the question of whether the pigments affect visual function is answered. They do. But the, the question of whether they do in an ecologically significant way, I guess, is the more, is the more pertinent question. Um, for example, I mentioned the, the problem of, of scattered light in the eye. And, and, and of course, that is a, a major problem, a uh, visual problem for, for a lot of, especially elderly, when you uh, develop more imperfections in, your, in, your anti, in the anterior structures of your eye. And, you're looking at a scene at night, that light tends to scatter, uh, will occlude a, a visual image. In fact, uh, disability due to glare is probably the, the number one complaint of the elderly, or the, the number one cause of, of uh, vehicular accidents in the United States during the day as well, actually, because of the a, a bright sunlight. Um, just to, 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 to give you a sense of how this affects vision, this was an image that I I got from Toss Vandenberg, who, who studies stray light, and that's a picture of Toss there. And this is, this is the same picture simulating an increase in intraocular scatter by about 40%. So it, it can have a very significant uh, effect on, on, on vision. And we know, of course, that the, the pigments can directly affect the amount of, of intraocular scatter. This was a study that was done by a group uh, in, here in Europe, and where they supplemented, uh, it was a uh, placebo-controlled double-blind study, and they, they supplemented lutein and zeaxanthin in, in various uh, combinations, and found in, in most of them that if they, if they measured, directly measured the intraocular scatter in these patients, they found a, a, you know, about a 30% reduction in, in, a, in, in, in two cases of, of the amount of scatter within the eye. So there was a direct effect on, on scatter. Now, we, we did a number of studies where we also measured this. And how we measured it in the lab was we, we present subjects with a, with a visual target here, surrounded by a big, bright uh, annulus. This annulus, we always try very hard to, to have uh, simulate daylight. So we use a xenon light source that's very broadband and, and, and matches sunlight pretty fairly closely. Um, what we do then is we have the intensity adjusted so that it induces scatter in the eye and at some point it will occlude the target and that's, their, that's the subject's glare disability 
threshold. Now we've, we've measured this in a, in a number of studies starting a few years ago. And uh, basically what we found is that when we measure macular pigment and then glare disability in the same eye, that there was a fairly direct correlation between the amount of macular pigment and the amount of energy the subject could withstand before losing sight of, of that, that central target. So we found this now in this in uh, several different studies measured in, in different ways. We've also done uh, interventions where we've, we've supplemented the subjects with, with uh, 12 milligrams of lutein and zeaxanthin a day for, for about six months and then measured the uh, amount of energy uh, that was required to veil these central targets. We found that as the, the pigment levels went up, the amount of energy that the subject could withstand also went up a, in a proportional way. So that was uh, indicated a, a direct relation. This is one subject. Of course, all subjects we, we test are completely anonymous, but this was a particularly attractive dashing man that we, we measured for over the course of a year who was around the lab. I'm, I'm so going to stop making jokes if no one's going to laugh at them. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we measured this person, you know, me, uh, report increasingly ever, and, and measured my glare disability at the, at the same time. And I had a very unexplained dip here where I had a bad period where everything kind of went down. And uh, but you can see that my, my glare disability followed fairly, fairly close uh, along. And again, this sort of makes, ma makes perfect sense because these pigments are absorbing this scattered light and less scattered light, less, less glare disability. And, you know, I, I think it's probably pretty clear that they are, it is, in fact, a filtering action. We, uh, as, as uh, Lisa was, was mentioning, we, we did a study where we, uh, we followed patients who, who had a, a, a blue-blocking lens implanted in, in one eye and a, and a clear lens in the other eye. And, and we, had to, we had to go all over the United States in order to find enough subjects who would be willing to have two different kind of implants in, in, in their eyes and uh, you know, measured the amount of energy they could withstand before for, uh, losing sight of that target and found that the, the eye with the blue blocking lens could withstand quite a bit more energy than the, the light without the blue blocking lens. And again, so it, it's, it's working as a filter. Filters filter light. It, optical effects are, are sort of optical. Um, now another way uh, we have measured this, and I'm not going to go through all this data because I think this crowd is pretty familiar with it, but is a few, other, a few other measurements. One is photostress recovery. And, um, and how, how you do that is you, you expose subjects to a very bright, sort of blinding light, which causes them to basically be temporarily blinded. And then you measure how long it takes for them to recover sight of a, of a visual stimulus. And that amount of time is, uh, is, their, is their photostress recovery. And I think uh, James presented some data on this in his poster yesterday. And, Basically, there's a fairly clear relationship between how much macular pigment is in the retina and, and photostress recovery. Again, you know, the, the more pigment you have, the less is isomerized when you're exposed to a very bright light, and hence the less has to reform in order to, to regain function. So that's a, a fairly direct effect of how much photopigment you have. Another, a similar effect is on, on glare discomfort. One, one, one irony is that exposure to, to bright light. And, and this, by the way, is another issue, of, of course, with, uh, with how light damages the retina over time. It damages the retina over time as a function of how much photosensitizers are in your eye. So the more photosensitizers, the more it'll damage. And so hence, older people are more damaged by intense light than younger people. Or light is most damaging, and damaged, damaging when, you're, uh, when you've been in the dark for a long time and you're suddenly exposed to lots of light. Because even rhodopsin is a, a very potent photosensitizer. So, uh, so you can get a lot of glare discomfort. And, I, and, and, and people have speculated that that's why light is so un uncomfortable at, when, when it's dark. So when you open the fridge at night, even that relatively uh, non-intense light is kind of blinding because you're, you're, you're so much uh, rhodopsin is, is, is formed. That's called glare discomfort, that discomfort. And, and one way of quantifying that is to measure your, your, your squint response. You can do a little EMG around the, around the ocular orbit and people will squint when, they, when they're uncomfortable. And when, we, when, when that's been measured, there's been a very direct relationship to, uh, to uh, 
to uh, the amount of macular pigment in the eye. And, and by the way, I should mention that it's, it's very exaggerated depending on the amount of short wave light. So your, 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 your discomfort to shorter wave light is much higher, even all things considered, the energy equated across wavelengths to, to longer wavelengths of light. So there's probably an evolved tendency to sort of squint when, you, when you're exposed to that kind of, of light. And, and again, just like the, the macular pigments, we find a similar effect with, these, with blue blocking lenses, sort of suggesting that indeed it's, it's mostly a, a, a filtering effect. Now, uh, now another um, possible uh, visual function of the pigments, and like I mentioned earlier, um, probably one, one uh, big use of uh, vision in, in for most of our evolutionary history was, was seeing items in, in the distance. And almost a decade ago, Dr. Wooten and I did a, a more theoretically based paper where we modeled the effects of, of uh, differing levels of macular pigment on, on visual range, and one of, the, one of the primary factors limiting how far people can see in, in the natural atmosphere is, uh, is the amount of scattered shortwave light. In fact, uh, one common uh, uh, description of this is blue haze, you know, purple mountains majesty. Uh, when you look in the distance, uh, shortwave light uh, limits how far you can see. So one idea is that uh, by absorbing that that light in the, in, in, interiorly, when it's imaged on the eye, you, you can see actually farther. So um, that was called the visibility hypothesis. And we've, we've just, uh, and, and in fact, the, the, the spectral absorption of the pigments is, is fairly uh, nicely matched to, the, to, to uh, measurements of blue haze in the atmosphere. When, in fact, uh, skylight peaks at about 460 nanometers, you know, coincidentally enough. And, and uh, right at the peak of the, of the pigments. So, so we, we, we've started uh, the study of this, and, 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 and one way we did it, and we, we, one, one, uh, one advantage of studying macular pigments, of course, is you can do interventions. You can give people lutein and zeaxanthin supplements, change the amount they have, and measure changes in their visual function. But that takes a while, and months and months. So we wanted to kind of speed it up a little bit. So we, we invented this uh, macular pigment filter. And uh, the first challenge with this, by the way, was to create an absolute spectrum for lutein and zeaxanthin in a filter, which is a lot harder than you might think. It, almost any solvent you put the carotenoids in causes a fairly significant uh, solvent shift. And you know, a lot of oils have a lot of turbidity. And, and so finding the right oil was a real challenge. I, for a long time, the vision science lab at UGA looked like a massage parlor because I tried every oil on the, in the, on the planet. And the, the best one, ironically, turned out to be uh, transparent mineral oils. And, and, and Dr. Schalk uh, provided us with some very pure zeaxanthin. That turned out to be the, the best because the, the actual shift in zeaxanthin offset the shift with the oil. So it, we got a pretty nice... Uh, absolute spectrum of, of lutein and zeaxanthin. Then we made a filter cell, basically, that was composed of two optical flats and then could be adjusted uh, along that, that optical path length. So, so then we could vary the optical density of the pigments based on path length. So that was a, our, our, our macular pigment uh, intervention. And, and what, we, what, we, what we found is that if you... Uh, if you varied the filter and then measured macular pigment through the filter, then it just added uh, linearly to the amount of macular pigment an individual had. So then we had some sort of macular pigment glasses, as you will, to see to see how it would affect uh, how it would affect visibility. Now we also wanted to to uh, simulate visibility in the atmosphere. Again, not an easy thing to do. It's especially hard outside. But um, how we did it in the lab was we we. We, uh, we used a xenon source, very broad band, very bright light source, white light source. And then we, we found a filter that when combined with the xenon source, perfectly matched atmospheric measurements of, of, of uh, blue haze. And then that light was interposed between the eye of the subject and grading targets. Then we could measure, uh, measure their ability to see these gratings through this intervening uh, blue haze. So that's that's how we did it. And, and what we found in the first study, 
was that there was a fairly uh, pronounced effect of adding uh, these these this the uh, this uh, amounts of this filtered uh, MP to uh, visibility thresholds. So there was about a 25 percent improvement, with about a you know 0.2 increase in the, in the amount of filter added. Sort of plateaued here, um, right about 0.5, but most of the subjects we used in the study already had fairly high amounts, so we, we got a, a plateau. We, we repeated this study now without the filter. These are, these are just data that I, we were finishing right before this talk. And, and what we did here was, uh, was rather than use the uh, the filter, we just used subjects with differing amounts of macular pigment measured in the retina. And then, um, and then these visibility measurements with, with adding various levels of haze and found that there was a very direct relationship between, um, between the amount of macular pigment in the eye and, and the amount of blue haze that someone could see through in order to, to identify target. And, and when, when, I, when I compare the... Uh, our empirical results with our modeling results, they actually compare quite well. The difference between someone uh, with very low macular pigment and someone with very high macular pigment in terms of how far they can see, all other things being equal, is about 30%. They could, they could see about 30% farther with, with higher levels. Now, just another example of some visual functions that, that we've measured is uh, chromatic contrast. And, and chromatic contrast is also a, uh, a feature of identifying objects in nature that's particularly important when looking at objects in the distance. Of course, edges are, are extremely important in vision, and, and, and there's two way, main ways of, of seeing an edge. One is, of course, luminance differences. That's mostly what you're doing when you're, when you're looking at the big E in a, in a Snellen chart, just the difference between the white and black is a big luminance difference. But in nature, of course, chromatic edges are, are, equally, uh, are equally prevalent. So, for example, in this image, this, is, this image uh, reduced to just the luminance differences. This is this image reduced to just the chromatic differences. So you use chromatic edges just as much as you use luminance edges in nature, and especially when something's at a distance, because the luminance differences tend to, tend to equilibrate. So we looked at, at a chromatic contrast. And of course, colored filters are likely to have a big effect on chromatic contrast. Because remember that these pigments absorb a good third of the, of the visible spectrum and that part of the visible spectrum that's very common in nature. So if you have a, a visual stimulus, say a baseball on a blue background, you'll have the pigments absorb the background more than the target, which uh, creates more contrast between the two, enhances the visibility of, of the object. So that's called the chromatic contrast. One way, the first way that we measured this, and again, five subjects, was to use a technique called the minimally distinct border. And what you do in this technique is you, you use a stimulus and you have a, a standard on one side and then a, 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 a matching stimulus on the other that you vary the wavelength of and then measure the, uh, have the subjects adjust this until it, it, they just minimally detect the border between the two. And what you, do, what you can do if you vary the wavelength is, is the, the spectrum that you get very closely matches the extinction spectrum of lutein and zeaxanthin, suggesting that it's a, a lutein and zeaxanthin effect. So it's affecting the appearance of, of a chromatic border. This was, there are two just larger studies where you use just uh, single wavelength conditions. But in that, we found that, you know, if you, if you test a lot of older subjects, there was a very strong relationship. Test even a, even a pretty big sample, there was a, the correlation here is about 0.6. So, there's a, a relatively strong relation between chromatic contrast and, uh, and macular pigment density. Now, those are, those are examples of visual functions that, that we found that are, are, were strongly related to, to the macular pigments. There is a, an older hypothesis of, of, of for the pigments, and when I mean older, now almost uh, two centuries old, uh, that the pigments have a, affect visual acuity. And, and the idea here, and in fact, this is probably still the most commonly cited idea for what the pigments do, is that they, could, they can improve acuity by reducing the, the, the deleterious effects of chromatic aberration. 
And the idea here is whenever you're looking at a, a visual image that's illuminated by broadband light, like sunlight, what will happen is the, is the, is the, the, middle, the middle wavelengths will be perfectly in focus at the plane of your retina, but short wave light will be in focus in front of your retina, and, and long wave light will be in focus behind your retina, so that will create a little bit of fringing which then would blur the border or make the object harder to see. So for example, in this image, you can see some blue fringing here, some red fringing here, some blue fringing there. So the idea is with enough fringing, you're going to reduce the, sh the sharpness of an edge. So it, uh, it would affect your acuity. That was, that was termed the acuity hypothesis. Um, so we measured that. And uh, again, how, how we did it in this case is again one of these a big Maxwell and View optical systems with xenon light, and we used gratings, uh, sine wave gratings, that we could do a forced choice test. So, so only one point for any individual subject here it takes about you know, 15 hours. So this is a very long experiment. So, so uh, we're not that many subjects, and we measured the the contrast sensitivity under conditions of very broadband light, i.e., light that you'd be you'd expect to be affected by fringing. And, uh, and shortwave uh, deficient light, light with no shortwave light, so not absorbed by the pigments at all, but, but matched for luminance. And what we found is that the two curves were, were, were close to indistinguishable. There's uh, the broadband lights indicated by these open circles here and the others by the squares, and you can see they're very close. So there, wasn't, there was clearly not a very large effect on, 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 on contrast sensitivity across these spatial frequencies of, of, of taking out the blurring part of this broadband light. Um, when we looked at just the individual frequencies, there, there was no relation except at eight cycles. And then there was a, this is just the ratio of short wave to long wave light, so it's sort of a, a within subject correction. And, um, and we found that you know, at eight cycles, there was just a little bit of a, a relation. You know, the, the absolute magnitude of it was small, but it was, but it was sig statistically significant. So uh, in this very carefully measured sample, there was only a very, very, very small effect of, of, uh, of, 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 of uh, chromatic aberration on visual function. And we had published a study some years ago that, w that found a similar, similar uh, result. Um, this is a study that, that James uh, published uh, just recently and where he measured best corrected visual acuity and macro pigment in a, in a large sample. And he found a small effect. And I think, that, uh, I think that's about right. I think that there's a very small effect and that you can detect in a, in a big sample. But the absolute magnitude of it is, is, is relatively small. So the acuity hypothesis. Now, all those uh, functions that I have talked about are, visual, are, are optical functions, really. But we know, of course, that the pigments are not simply in the macula. And so, so one might uh, question whether there are some non-optical effects of the pigments. In fact, for example, uh, the data that uh, Rohini uh, presented the, uh, the other day uh, shows that the pigments are throughout the visual system. They're certainly throughout the eye, but they're also most concentrated in the visual cortex, and, and, and they have known effects on neural function. So I think that it's a reasonable question to ask, are they affecting uh, visual function in, in non-optical ways? Um, we have some data that would, would, would support that idea. One, one is there, there are cross-sectional data that link um, uh, the, the, the levels of macro pigment, which may reflect levels in the brain, to cognitive function. Um, we also have a few other sources of empirical data. For example, this is, these are a couple of studies that we've done over the last few years where we've measured uh, temporal function. And there are several ways to measure temporal function. Certainly one of the easiest ways is called the critical flicker fusion threshold. So the idea here is you present subjects with a stimulus. In this case, a stimulus that's not even absorbed by the pigment, so there's no chance for an optical effect. And you flicker it faster and faster and faster and faster, and it'll fuse. And, th and this tends to be uh, actually one of the best visual functions that you can measure if you're assessing the effects of aging. One of the, the hallmarks of, of, of aging is, is slowing of the system. And so, uh, 
So when, when we've done that, measured critical flicker thresholds and related them to various levels of macular pigment, we found that subjects with the, that there was a relationship. The subjects with the lowest amount of macular pigment had the uh, slowest vision, and subjects with higher amounts had the fastest vision. And uh, we found that in, in a couple of studies now. Um, here's just another. This is, we measured the entire uh, temporal uh, modulation transfer function the, and, and the, the amount of macular pigment and found a relation. We've even found relations between serum lutein and, and temporal function. That's obviously not a optical effect but it's one that we've repeated uh, a, a number of ways. Another example of a, a non-optical effect is we found relations to uh, scotopic, uh, the, the scotopic system. Of course, lutein and zeaxanthin are in rods, but in, in, uh, in not uh, optically significant ways. They don't absorb light uh, in rods. So in this study, for instance, we measured scotopic sensitivity way in the periphery and the amount of uh, noise in the system. You can do that by measuring uh, variability in thresholds around a psychometric function and found a, a relation between the two. We've measured older people and found relations to the sensitivity of the, system, of, of the scotopic system. So there seems to be some relations there that aren't wonderfully predicted by, by optical effects. Here's another example. We recently, in, as part of our, our studies on athletes, uh, I've been looking at visual reaction time. And what you do here is we have this big long track of, of white LEDs and you have subjects uh, react to a visual stimulus that can either appear in a fixed portion of the, of the track or a variable portion of the track. That's a fixed and variable reaction time. And what we found is that there's a, a relation between macro pigment density and reaction time measured in these, in these two different ways. Again, unlikely to be an optical effect. Um, now just to sort of conclude, we, we, we've, because of the, these possibilities, now there's the, a big interest in the fact that, in the, in the possibility, that pigments could influence brain function. They're in the brain for, for some reason, presumably. And, and so we, as along with Liz, have been looking at things like cognitive function and how, uh, how the pigments might influence that. And um, what we're doing now is we're, we're, we're looking at patients with dementia, normal patients, older patients, assessing them in a number of ways, their visual function to be sure, but also things like doing functional neuroimaging, uh, high density EEG, magnoencephalography, all these central measures of function. And, and, and basically our, our, what we've been finding in a, a preliminary way is that there, is, uh, there are relations to to between macular pigment and these various cognitive indices for these older individuals. So if you look at visual spatial function or, or memory functions, a lot of the various uh, uh, cognitive indices like uh, immediate memory, there's, there are correlations to, to macular pigment. This is a, da a similar data that's, that's in the process of, of being published that uh, Lisa and Liz did together where they looked at a number of, of cognitive functions in a, a larger sample of older women and um, found correlations between, between cognitive function. So I, I, uh, just to, to conclude, I think that these pigments probably affect vision in, in, in two major ways. Certainly there, there are optical effects that you would affect, find in, in any, uh, for any yellow filter. It's, it's probably not a coincidence that there is a ubiquity of intraocular yellow filters in nature. They tend to be yellow. They're not green or red. They're, they're, they're yellow filters. Um, there's, there's certainly biological effects. I mean, I think a lot of effects that we see uh, clinically are, due, are probably due just to having a healthier retina and a clear, ret clear lens. But, um, but there probably could be effects that are, that are purely physiological, the effects of, of the pigments on neural function. And uh, that, would, that leads to a sort of pleiotropic effect on, on, on vision. And I think I'll uh, on there. Thank you very much.